Hi everyone, I'm back with the Phantom Toll Booth Read Aloud. Um, I am actually up in the reading loft in my classroom. Uh, for those of you in the Dogwood community, I imagine you recognize this view and I thought you might enjoy seeing it. Um, so yeah, we're going to kick off with chapter four, but before we do, uh, just a quick recap. Chapter three found our main character Milo with his new travel companion, Tok, the watchdog. Uh, found them in Dictionopolis, the kingdom of Dictionopolis, where all words in the entire world come from. They're grown in their orchards, just like you might grow an apple. Um, Milo and Tok had an interesting encounter with five hmm, synonymous alliterative gentlemen uh, who invited them to a feast at the king with the king. Um, and then before... Before Milo could even respond, they had disappeared back into the crowd. And that's where chapter four picks back up. Chapter four, confusion in the marketplace. Indeed it was, for as they approached, Milo could see crowds of people pushing and shouting their way among the stalls, buying and selling, trading and bargaining. Huge wooden wheeled carts streamed into the market square from the orchards, and long caravans bound for the four corners of the kingdom made ready to leave. Sacks and boxes were piled high, waiting to be delivered to the ships that sailed the Sea of Knowledge, and off to one side a group of minstrels sang songs to the delight of those either too young or too old to engage in trade. But above all the noise and tumult of the crowd could be heard the merchants' voices loudly advertising their products, Get your fresh picked if fans or butts here. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya. Nice ripe wares, whens, whys, hows. Juicy, tempting words for sale. So many words and so many people. They were from every place imaginable, and some places even beyond that. And they were all busy sorting, choosing, and stuffing things into cases. As soon as one case was filled, another was begun. There seemed to be no end to the bustle and activity. Milo and Tok wandered up and down the aisles, looking at the wonderful assortment of words for sale. There were short ones and easy ones for everyday use. There were long and very important ones for special occasions, and even some marvelously fancy words packed in individual gift boxes for use in royal decrees and pronouncements. Step right up, step right up! Fancy, best quality words right here, announced one man in a booming voice. Step right up, uh, what can I do for you, little boy? How about a nice bag full of pronouns? Or maybe you'd like an assortment of names. Milo had never much thought about words before, but these looked so good that he longed to have some. Look, talk, he cried. He was much more interested in finding a bone than in shopping for new words. Maybe if I buy some, I can learn how to use them, said Milo, Milo eagerly as he began to pick through the words in the stall. Finally, he chose three which looked particularly good to him. Quagmire, flabbergast, and upholstery. He had no idea what they meant, but they looked very grand and elegant. How much are these? Milo inquired. And when... The man whispered the answer. Milo quickly put them back on the shelf and started to continue forward. Why not take a few pounds of happies, advised the salesman. Happy birthday, happy new year, happy days, happy go lucky. They're much more practical and very useful. I'd like to very much, began Milo, but... Or perhaps you'd be interested in a package of goods. Always handy for good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye, the salesman suggested. Milo did want to buy something, but the only money he had was the coin he needed to get back through the toll booth. And Tok, of course, had nothing but time. No, thank you, replied Milo. We're just browsing. And they continued on through the market. As they turned down the last aisle of stalls, Milo noticed a wagon that seemed different from the rest. On its side was a small, neatly lettered sign that said, Do it yourself. And inside were 26 bins 
filled with all the letters of the alphabet from A to Z. These are for the people who like to make their own words, the man in charge informed him. You can pick any assortment you like, or buy a special box complete with all letters, punctuation marks, and a book of instructions. Here, taste an A. They're very good. Milo nibbled carefully at the letter and discovered it was quite sweet and delicious, just the way you'd expect an A to taste. I knew you'd like it, laughed the letter man, popping two G's and an R into his mouth and letting the juice drip down his chin. A's are one of the most popular letters. All of them aren't that good, he confided in a low voice. Take the Z, for instance. Very dry and dusty. And the X? Hardly anyone uses them. The X tastes like a trunk full of stale air. But most of the other letters are quite tasty. Try some more. He handed Milo an I, which was icy and refreshing, and talk a crisp and crunchy C. Most people are just too lazy to make their own words, the man continued, but it's much more fun. Is it difficult? I'm not much good at making words, admitted Milo, spitting the pits from a P. Perhaps I can be of some assistance. A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-C-E, buzzed an unfamiliar voice. And when Milo looked up, he saw an enormous bee, at least twice his size, sitting on top of the wagon. I am the spelling bee, announced the spelling bee. Don't be alarmed. A-L-A-R-M-E-D. Talk ducked under the wagon, and Milo, who was not overly fond of normal-sized bees, began to back away very timidly. I can spell anything. A-N-Y-T-H-I-N-G, he boasted, testing his wings. Try me, try me. Can you spell goodbye? suggested Milo as he continued to back away. The bee gently lifted himself into the air and circled lazily over Milo's head. Perhaps, P-E-R-H-A-P-S. You are m under the misapprehension, M-I-S, A-P-P-R-E-H-E-N-S-I-O-N, -E -E that I am dangerous, the bee said, turning a small loop to the left. Let me assure, A-S-S-U-R-E, you, that my intentions are peaceful, P-E-A-C-E-F-U-L. And with that, he settled back on top of the wagon and fanned himself with one wing. Now, he panted, think of the most difficult word you know, and I'll spell it. Hurry up! Hurry up! And he jumped up and down patiently. He looks friendly enough, thought Milo not sure just how friendly a friendly bumblebee should be, and tried to think of a very difficult word. Spell vegetable, he suggested, for it was one that always troubled him in school. Oh, that's a difficult one, said the bee, winking at the letter man. Let me see now. Hmm. He frowned and wiped his brow and paced slowly back and forth on top of the wagon. How much time do I have? Only ten seconds, cried Milo excitedly. Count them off, Tuck. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, the bee repeated, continuing to pace nervously. Then, just as time ran out, he spelled as fast as he could, V-E-G-E-T-A-B-L-E. -E. Correct, shouted the letter man, and everyone cheered. Can you spell everything? asked Milo admiringly. Just about, replied the bee with a hint of pride in his voice. You see, years ago I was just an ordinary bee, minding my own business, smelling flowers all day, and occasionally picking up part-time work in people's bonnets. Then, one day I realized I'd never amount to anything without an education. And being naturally adept at spelling, I decided that BALDERDASH! shouted a booming voice. And from around the wagon stepped a large, beetle-like insect, dressed in a lavish coat, striped pants, checked vest, spats, and a derby hat. Let me repeat, Balderdash, he shouted again, swinging his cane and clicking his heels in midair. Come now, don't be ill-mannered. Isn't someone going to introduce me to the lonely boy? This, said the bee with complete disdain, is the humbug, a very dislikable fellow. Nonsense, 
Everyone loves a humbug, shouted the humbug, as I was saying to the king just the other day. You've never met the king, accused the bee angrily. Then, turning to Milo, he said, Don't believe a thing this old fraud says. Bosh! replied the humbug. We're an old and noble family, honorable to the core. Insecticus humbugium, if I may use the Latin. Why, we fought in the Crusades with Richard the Lionheart, crossed the Atlantic with Columbus, blazed trails with the pioneers, and today many members of the family hold prominent government positions throughout the world. History is full of us humbugs. A very pretty speech. S-P-E-E-C-H, sneered the bee. Now, why don't you go away? I was just advising the lad of the importance of proper spelling. Bah! said the bug, putting an arm around Milo. As soon as you learn to spell one word, they ask you to spell another. You can never catch up, so why bother? Take my advice, my boy, and forget about it. As my great-great-great-grandfather, George Washington Humbug, used to say, You, sir shouted the bee very excitedly. You, sir, are an imposter. I am P-O-S-T-O-R, who can't even spell his own name. A slavish concern for the composition of words is the sign of a bankrupt intellect, roared the humbug, waving his cane furiously. Milo didn't have any idea what this meant. But it seemed to infuriate the spelling bee, who flew down and knocked off the humbug's hat with his wing. Be careful, shouted Milo as the bug swung his cane again, catching the bee on the foot and knocking over the box of W's. My foot, shouted the bee. My hat, shouted the bug, and the fight was on. The spelling bee buzzed dangerously in and out of range of the old humbug's wildly swinging cane as they menaced and threatened one another, and the crowd stepped back out of danger. There must be some other way, too, began Milo, and then he yelled, Watch out! But it was too late. There was a tremendous crash as the humbug in his great fury tripped into one of the stalls, knocking it into another, which knocked into another, then another, then another, until every stall in the marketplace had been upset and the words lay scrambled in great confusion all over the square. The bee, who had tangled himself in some bunting, toppled to the ground, knocking Milo over on top of him, and lay there shouting, Help! Help! There's a little boy on me! The bug sprawled untidily on a mound of squashed letters and talk. His alarm ringing persistently was buried under a pile of words. So one of my favorite mental images from chapter four uh, happens when the humbug and the spelling bee are getting into an altercation and the humbug swings his cane at the spelling bee and the spelling bee is trying to fly down and knock off the humbug's hat. And uh, before you know it, one person falls into another and the humbug falls into a stall, which hits another stall, which hits another stall, and you have a domino effect. Um, and before you know it, all of the words are on the ground in a mix of confusion. Um, that scene of stall hitting a stall, hitting a stall, hitting a stall really resonates with me. And it reminded me of uh, these really cool devices that are called Rube Goldberg devices. And they involve setting things up in a series so that when you push something at the start, it'll start a series of reactions. And so I have behind me set up a number of Jenga pieces. And at the end, I have a little ball. And I'm hopeful that when I start my Rube Goldberg machine, I'll knock over all the pins. I haven't recorded it yet. Shall we see how it goes? Come on! Got the Jenga pieces right, but not the pins yet. Round two. All right, I made some changes to my machine, and um, I realized my ball at the end needed more speed, so I tried to build a little bit of a ramp. 
We're gonna see. I appreciate you sticking with me. All right. Attempt number two. No! So close! All right, attempt three. I increased the ramp angle even more to give my ball more speed. Let's see what happens. Uh, my heart is still beating after that first activity. Um, that was the first Rube Goldberg machine I've ever made. Um, and I'm pretty surprised I was successful after three attempts. Um, I've included a link to one Rube Goldberg machine of the, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands, that are out there on YouTube. Um, if you enjoyed my short one, um, I highly encourage you to try to do one of your own. Um, Break it up into small chunks, just like those big projects. So if you want to make a machine that will trigger a few different actions, start with one and get that one really well, and then work on the second one and figure out how to make that transition. Um, I only had two real movements. Pushing of the Jenga pieces, you could use dominoes, um, to hit a ball, which would go down a ramp and hit the pins. Um, the video I share is pretty impressive. It uses a lot of things you would have in your house, um, but but uh, it's very, very, very impressive. I watched it multiple times. Um, so yeah, I hope you'll try that one. Now, my second activity um, comes before we meet the spelling bee, be before we meet the humbug. Um, Milo is interacting with a salesperson at the do-it-yourself um, stall. And I want to go back to the text because I always go back to the text because um, it helps me to really pull out the author's words. Now, the salesperson says, Most people are just too lazy to make their own words, but it's much more fun. So my challenge for you today is to coin your own word. And I went through, and uh, I have had one that's kind of been in my vocabulary um, for a while now, but it is not in a dictionary, but I use it, and occasionally when I use it, people will kind of perk up and say, what does that word mean? And I'll get to explain it to them, because I haven't coined my own word. My younger sister coined it, but I use it. Um, so the word is truche, and it comes from combining two words which are in existence, and some of you probably use one, maybe both of them. True, a word that... Um, indicates that something is consistent with fact, it's accurate, it's reliable. And touche, uh, perhaps a word you haven't heard of, or maybe you have heard it. It's often used in a dialogue between individuals uh, to acknowledge a clever point. So what I would like for you to do is, once you coin your own word, let's make a dictionary um, entry so that we can include it in our dictionary, because it's now a word that you're hopefully going to use. So the dictionary always starts by breaking a word into its syllables. So true, she, two syllables, true, she, or true, she. Next, you write out how to pronounce the word. Because if I just saw this word, I might say tra, tra, she, tra, she. So these pronunciation symbols help me to know that it's pronounced true true she and then the dictionary always says what part of speech it is true she is used as an interjection it's something that you just throw in to a statement um, it can stand alone um, it often is followed by an exclamation point and now what you're most accustomed to with dictionaries I'm sure is the definition so the definition of true she it's used during a discussion to acknowledge an undeniably true and clever point. Now, a lot of times a dictionary will also include a sentence uh, demonstrating how to use the word. So, if my younger sister was here right now, she would say, Mr. O, you titled this coin your own word. But you didn't coin anything. All you did was take my word, which I coined, 
And I would look her in the eye and respond, Trouche.